So <laughs> welcome. Um, if um, this is, if you're joining us, this is a public forum on the redevelopment of 196 Cook Avenue. And I just want to do a little help. We, we slated the time to um, be meeting from six and be out of here by seven. So I want to start as close to on time as possible. There's some people in the Zoom room um, that I have that should all be in, but I'm just going to check here. And I just want to go over the format a little bit. So do it on. Um, if anybody is logged in um, with their own computer, if you could please mute it um, in this room, <laughs> not out there in the Zoom world. Um, and if you want to come and speak, when we get to the public comment section, if you come up to the podium, please, and use the microphone so that everybody can hear both in here as well as out there. Um, and I'm going to, I'm just going to do a quick check here to make sure that we've got everyone in the waiting room and um, that No, folks... I'm going to let you do it on my phone. Okay, that's the issue. So I'm going to mute everybody. Um, uh, yeah. So. Hang on a second. Um, now I've lost my participant screen. Okay. I think we're all set. Um, okay. So it looks like, um, folks have come in from the waiting room. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, we're really here tonight to talk about um, the draft concept plans for um, this site that includes um, where the former Moose Lodge was and will include parking for the conservation area, which we haven't had before, and then housing, uh, affordable housing. And so we've got um, Megan McDonough from Habitat for Humanity here because they're an interested partner with us on this project and we've worked closely with them to think about where we can place these conceptual layouts for what meets their requirements and then Ward Councilor Stan Moulton is here as well so um, I think that you know as we go through this process we can all be available to answer questions. Um, the, I'm going to go through, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop my screen share for just a second and just take care of some. Um, okay, so. I want to leave meeting. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So, oh boy. Sorry about this. Back to screen share. Okay. So, we just have a quick presentation to go over the site and um, to go over. Um, We'll have we'll take um, comments in person and then from the Zoom room, and then um, I'm going to go over the process um, of where we are, sort of in this whole um, timeline, I guess, of this um, permitting. So first, just to let you know that this is sort of the kickoff to the subsequent process. So we want to get public comment on the concept plans, and then we'll take those into consideration and then think about um, final tune-ups before submitting an application to the planning board. So both these parts of the project require planning board permitting through site plan approval. So anytime there's a parking lot that's built that's bigger than uh, six parking spaces or um, more than one detached unit on a property requires site plan. And in this case, for allowing additional density for the purposes of providing affordable housing, that also requires planning board permitting. So that's the, the planning board permitting is the phase in which there will be very detailed um, information about lighting and landscaping and um, 
building design and the parking lot materials and sort of all of that fine-tuned engineering will come at the planning board phase. So that is coming. That is not what we're here tonight to talk about. <clears throat> so just starting out, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This is sort of an existing conditions um, review here. And let me just zoom in. Um, there we go. Oops, that was a little too far. So these are the conditions we're dealing with. So on the left is really just an aerial photo of the site showing the parking, the um, former area that was used to access the Moose Lodge. Um, and the Cook Avenue entrance coming in. On the right side is a colorized version of this based on our survey. So the red indicates the previous graveled area or disturbed area. Um, this isn't representative of the site plan that you'll see next on the slide, but I just wanted to show you sort of quickly through color, the orange or the lighter um, orange there represents the wetland boundary or buffer zone. So those are constraints for the property. And then the red shows where the existing disturbed gravel or building area is located. So that's sort of the context of where and how and why we came up with a layout that um, is on the next page. And so here is the draft um, layout of the plans showing um, from Cook Avenue. Again, it's the same orientation as those other pictures. So coming in the existing driveway access with a 20 foot wide um, paved driveway, um, coming into 22 uh, parking spaces, two of which would be um, ADA accessible parking spaces over here where my cursor is that you may not see, but there's a little shading area that's accessible parking. The trail connection goes up to the conservation area and um, and then the private driveway. So this would be considered a shared driveway at this point. Then the private driveway to the homes would come off here to the southwest, I guess, and then and um, terminate with these parking spaces. And these may shift depending on what um, habitat um determines works for them best. So again, this isn't the site plan for the for the in front of the planning board, but right now this conceptually sh shows six parking spaces and then the four um, homes sort of set back against um, into the ledge area. And um, you don't see the colorized map here, but this dashed line that sort of runs through some of these um, units here is the 100 foot buffer area, which is the um, area within which um, any kind of work requires a permit from the Conservation Commission, the wetlands being um, both down here on the what would be the south side of the property and also on the north and easterly side is a wetland as well. Um, the gray areas really show um, parking within the existing gravel disturbed area. Um, for all of this. And that was sort of, we wanted to make sure we stayed in that red zone um, and didn't encroach further beyond that, except for the areas that were outside of the um, wetland um, buffer zone. So um, that's what this plan shows um, here. This um, a line that sort of comes at an angle, a point here, and then comes across really close to that curve in the parking lot. And then straight around here is would be the property line for the for the um, four affordable housing lot um, project. And um, this is the former, this lighter boundary, which you may be hard to see is the excuse me, footprint of the former Moose Lodge. Um, so we've received comments already um, before this meeting. So there was a, um, we received email comments. So I've just identified some of those that um, certainly I'm sure folks may want to add to or have their own, but I just wanted to let you know what we've heard already, that um, there was a question about what, uh, providing bike racks for the conservation area and not just parking spaces. 
and um, also that there should be bike storage for the habitat um, structure or homes. And that um, just wanted to let you all know that bike storage is required as part of any uh, planning board um, permitting. So it can be either sheltered storage or outside storage, but I'll let um, Megan speak to sort of their format and what they tend to provide and, and the storage areas that they um, are, look to design. We also received comments about why isn't there more space between the parking lot and habitat parking? And again, um, sort of going back to that map of constraints and wanting to stay as far away from the wetland and the wetland buffer as possible and stay within the existing disturbed area is one of the major region, reasons why the sort of clustered in this one portion of the property. Um, also, there's ledge. So if you push too far back, then you have to deal with um, additional construction um, costs and complications. And the more spread out you are, of course, means the more pavement that you have to lay down. So not only is that adding to impervious surface, that's a cost and also has a long-term maintenance um, impact with plowing and um, just maintaining surface area for the residents. Um, there was also a question about whether there would be EV charging ports at the homes. And again, that's more of a detail that would be better suited for um, Habitat's mission and what they provide. We don't require that for residential um, properties of this sort. Um, and then we had also a comment that perhaps there were too many parking spaces shown on the plans. And so that maybe we should think about reducing that number. And, you know, frankly, if we're balancing and we're trying to provide more bicycle parking, I could see where we might look at swapping out uh, one or two parking spaces and putting in bike racks instead in those spaces, if that um, seems, and that seems like a, you know, um, a beneficial um, modification to the plan. So with that, I would turn it over to Habitat and then we can do questions and comments. Hi, I'm Megan McDonough. I'm the executive director at Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. Um, we've been building homes in Hampshire and Franklin counties for over 30 years. We've done 50 homes and a number of them here in Northampton. Our uh, specialty is affordable home ownership. Um, so we don't do rental apartments, um, but and we look to, whenever possible, provide a independent single-family home with as many as few shared resources as possible. Which sounds a little counterintuitive, but um, it's because our our homeowners are selected through a lottery process, so they're not choosing each other, and it's very difficult to manage a small condominium association of two to four people. Um, we're willing to consider the um, responsibility, setting them up for success as best we can with the shared driveway um, by creating the management structure ahead of time, doing all those things. But having four detached homes means that they're responsible for their own home maintenance. And the only shared condominium responsibilities would be around the landscape and the driveway. So that minimizes the amount of uh, uh, you know, if you just randomly picked your neighbors and then you had to make financial decisions together, that that's a limiting factor for the, some of those choices. Also, because we sell our homes to people below 60% of the area median income, sometimes this is their only opportunity to own a home in Northampton. So they don't have the economic mobility to move if they happen to not like their neighbor. Um, so I, I'm giving that context because I think one of the first reactions to this plan is, well, why don't you just build attached housing? Um, I know that wasn't one of the key comments you mentioned, but it's certainly something that has come up um, in the conversations that I've had with people about this possibility. Um, we're really excited, though, about the opportunity for home ownership so close to conservation, the path through the woods there, but also walking distance to a, by, a bus. You know, it's not too far to get to Walmart. And um, it's, you know, it's a great neighborhood. And I think that it would be an amazing opportunity for uh, some families who can't otherwise afford to live in the city to get a chance to live somewhere where they can also access 
the incredible resources of the city. Um, my primary goal of being here tonight is to answer questions about how Habitat might interact with something like this. Um, we tend to build small, simple, energy efficient homes. Right now we're building um, three homes on Burt's Pit Road that are 700, 800, and 1,000 square feet. So our houses range up to maybe 1,300 square feet. And we do one-story and two-story homes whenever we can. But we have a limited budget. We utilize volunteer labor for help with carpentry. Sometimes we work with Smith Vocational for plumbing and electrical. But we're often hiring subcontractors for things like excavation, which there'd be a fair amount for this project, paving, um, other skilled trades like that. The further away from Cook Avenue the houses get, um, I know Carolyn mentioned the expense of future plowing and installing pavement, but there's also the expense of extending the water and sewer lines, um, which is significant. So there is a desire to cluster as close as possible, but also create some buffer in between the public and private space. I think that this is plan is off to a great start with the clear division of the parking. I think, you know, this it would be easy enough to put a sign up that says this is private parking and make it pretty clear this is the public parking. Um, I wish there was a little more space between the corner house as well, but I'm not the landscape architect or engineer to figure out if there is a way to get more space or if they squeeze it in as best they can. Mm -hmm. um, I think some fencing or vegetative screening will go a long way though. So I guess those are my general comments. Great, and I don't know, Councillor, if you have anything that you want to add or if we should just, um, if you wanted to go to questions. Um, well, let me just briefly say thank you, Carolyn, for organizing this. It's very important that, um, that the city work together with the existing uh, neighbors in this neighborhood so that you, you know you're aware of the plan, the planning process, and that we hear from you and take your concerns, questions, and comments into consideration. I'm delighted to be sitting next to, to Megan. Uh, Habitat has a wonderful uh, uh, track record, as she mentioned, 30 years of putting up affordable housing in these two counties, including Northampton. The model that Habitat uses for uh, affording affordable home ownership possibilities to people who might not otherwise have those opportunities is terrific. So uh, I'm very happy to have this project uh, being uh, uh, proposed in Ward 1. Um, Carolyn mentioned a very important word, and that's balance, balancing. Uh, in this case, we have existing an existing neighborhood uh, around Cook Avenue, Pine's Edge. We want to be respectful of the people who are currently living there. We have uh, four, potentially four new families moving into the housing there that we want to be respectful of. And we also have the visitors who uh, park there to use the conservation area who uh, we want to accommodate, but also make sure that they understand that, um, you know, we're going to have some, th th there's going to be some changes to to this area, and they need to be respectful of, of that. So with that, um, I think we're all happy to hear from you. Um, thank you, Stan. I appreciate that. Um, so let's start with if there's anybody in um, present that would like to speak, if you could come up to the microphone and make sure that the green light is lit by pushing the button. And if you want to state your name and town of residence, that would be great. And any comments that you have. And then after comments are done here, we'll go to Zoom. And um, if people in Zoom would raise their electronic hand or wave, then we'll try to get um, everybody who wants to make a comment there. So is there anybody here in this room that has a comment to make? Um, hi, and thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Christine Clark. I live at 14 Pines Edge. And you probably don't have answers to my questions, but I'm going to throw them in your direction. Um, I look at those parking spots and 
I'm not quite sure how you're going to fit all those parking spots in there, but I do know we need them. Um, what happens when you close the lot, like when they were grading the lot, they close the lot and everybody then parks up Pine's Edge. And they also park in front of Michelle and Jeff's house. Um, just recently, the other day, when the lot was closed, um, cars were parked on both sides. So an ambulance would never be able to get in to our, uh, to our condo association area, nor could a fire engine. So I guess my initial concern is during construction, is the lot going to be closed, trailhead closed, Nobody's going to be allowed back there. Um, if not, and you're just going to close the lot and allow people to walk in, they're going to be parking up Pine's Edge. And again, that's it's 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 hard to get an ambulance and a fire engine in there when that happens. So I I myself would like for the city to consider putting no parking signs up. Um, and and on, in all honesty, if the the spots are all taken, they park up Pine's Edge, and so I think going up Pine's Edge and in that immediate area, uh, no parking signs would be appropriate, uh, especially if you want to get emergency care in. And like I said the other day, you could not have gotten an ambulance up that road because there was parking on both sides, cars parked on both sides. So that was a concern during construction, how you're going to manage that. Um, I mean, personally, I would hope that everything just gets shut down and nobody can access it, but I'm not sure when you're going to be starting this project. Um, so the no parking signs. And then the other concern was when they tore down the Moose Lodge, um, the, I don't, I'm not, I think seven o'clock is the noise. Is seven o'clock noise? Well, these guys would arrive at, at 6.15, 6.30 and idle their diesel trucks. And I live right there. And sometimes I can sleep late and waking up to a diesel truck at 6.15 for 45 minutes. So I would hope that the people that are working on the lot would be mindful of that. Um, so that would be very helpful. And then the other thing that I was... Um, you know, hoping going forward with this is the lighting. Um, I know at Pine's Edge, we have no outside lights. The only lights that we have are the lights that we can have on or off at our front door. Um, there's a lot of animal wildlife back there. If you go motion detecting, it's going to be strobe light effect. Um, we're hoping because it is so dark out there at nighttime. I know Stan's been there at night. Um, we really like to keep it dark uh, for the animals and for us. Um, we can see the stars and it's it's really lovely. So um, I just hope that lighting isn't like a big fixture that's on all the time. Um, again, we control all of our own lights. Um, and then I have like little walking lights, you know, that are solar along the pathway that are very low lit. And um, I just hope that there's not a lot of overhead lights. So that's where we are right now, or I am right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle Bernhard. I live at 164 Cook Avenue. I'm the last property on the left before you go into the Moose Lodge Drive. And I moved in there in 1998, so I've been there for 25 years. So I've lived through the Moose Lodge and, um, you know, the homeless community and um, now this. Um, and I guess my concern, I'm thrilled that it's going to be Habitat for Humanity that's doing this project. That gives me a great deal of um, comfort. And um, I just hope that it will be done um, cautiously and carefully so that the wetlands are preserved, that there's enough room for parking. Um, I would love it if the, the committee or the people who are doing this would be willing to come up and walk some of us around so that we can see where the actual lines are. Um, there's that weird uh, piece of property that is a wetland buffer, but it's also um, common common land that's the cities i believe um so and i too share the um the worry about lighting having it be this big beacon up here because that's like been the wilderness for us for a long time 
Um, and yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about my property lines, what they look like. A lot of pink ribbons are up in there, but that's just me. Um, that doesn't affect other people, I suppose. I'm just wondering where they are and which are on our side and your side. Um, there was one other thing I was thinking of. Um, maybe it will come to me. Um, oh, yeah, and the parking lot um, and putting the new sewage in, uh, sewage pipes in there and water pipes. Um, it seems like if we're going to be going in there just to continue a little further it might not be too much. I don't know if there's a lot of rock back there or what. Um, but you know, I'm not sure why we need to cluster them all the way over if that's a wetland thing or if that's just saving money on the sewer and water. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for inviting us to come share our concerns. Thank you. Anyone else here? Bob? <laughs> Hi, I too thank you for having this session tonight. I'm Bob Zimmerman. I'm president of Broadbrook Coalition, which co-manages the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area together with the city. We have a, a great interest in what is happening to the old Moose Lodge lot. We're very pleased on a number of scores. Uh, one is the disappearance of the old Moose Lodge building, which was never very attractive. Uh, second is for the redevelopment of housing. We're pleased that Habitat for Humanity is going to be in charge. Um, probably you don't know, but Broadway Coalition has a mandate to support affordable housing in Northampton with a certain amount of its income. And for the last five or six years at least, or maybe more than that, our donation has gone to Habitat for Humanity. So we're very pleased to see Habitat uh, in the picture. We do a lot of surveys <clears throat> at Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. We survey wildlife, we survey birds, <clears throat> we survey invasive plants, we survey people who walk their dogs off leash, uh, which is against the law. And we also survey the parking lot at the, we still call it the Moose Lodge <laughs> and probably will forever, but we still, we do monitor parking there. And uh, just to give you an informal idea, uh, without going into boring details, yesterday on Sunday, there were 15 cars there at one point. This morning, there were 10 cars, which is really, um, uh, Monday mornings are usually quite slack. I was surprised there were that many this afternoon. There were eight cars. So it is used by a lot of people. A lot of people use that entrance to Fitzgerald Lake for hiking some bike, um, but it's mostly hiking and uh, people come and go. It's very hard to tell how many people there will be at any one time, but the number fluctuates throughout the day and it's quite heavily used. It's one of two principal entrances to Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. Uh, the other is on North Farms Road, almost opposite uh, to the west of the Moose Lodge area. And um, there are a few entrances on um, Coles Meadow Road, but they're awkward. Uh, they're not really ones that we encourage the use of, partly because you have to park on Coles Meadow Road if you're hiking, if you're uh, coming by car, and it makes it narrow and uh, quite dangerous. So Moose Lodge is one of the main entrances, probably the most heavily used entrance to Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area and it's used by a lot of people. So I strongly support the number of parking spaces for the conservation area that have been incorporated into the draft plan. I think there are roughly 20. I think that's what uh, Broadway Coalition has been recommending for the period uh, in which the discussion about the redevelopment of that property has been, <clears throat> has been current. And, um, I think any less than that would prove a problem for just the reason that Ms. Clark was citing that people, if they can't find a place to park uh, next to the um, Buggy Meadow Road, the entrance to Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, 
they will park on Cook Avenue, they'll park in Pines Edge parking area, and that is something that we would certainly like to discourage. So it's like to see enough parking uh, available on site uh, at the site of the old Moose Lodge or close to where it used to be. And I think the, uh, looking at the draft plan, I think that was very well worked out. And uh, it separates the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area parking like parking area from the, the habitat. And of course, they're going to be close neighbors, but I think anything that can be done to sort of separate those two sets of interests is um, a very good idea. So thanks again for considering, and uh, we'll see how things develop. Thanks, Bob. Anybody else here before we go to Zoom? Hi, I'm Terry Reynolds, um, resident here, civil engineer in town. And um, I uh, just uh, looking at the plan, I, I think the parking is is very suited for for the use there. Often have been there when when there have been 20 cars. Um, and uh, additionally, I, I would support staying at that level because it, it is an definite uh, issue for people when you have people parking in front of your house and then the safety issues over there. Um, I, I would say that a little more separation between the two parking lots, the residential and the, and the public would be in the, in the interests of both parties. Um, so you don't end up with conflicts of people using the parking lot and then residents being disturbed. Um, I had done a markup where I think if if you just switch the northerly unit to the south, um, that would help. And then side, you don't really need to shift the parking areas too much, but you could extend that with sidewalks, maybe shift the residential parking lot enough to add a little more vegetative buffer between the two. Um, if there was a, a good vegetative screen between the two, it would go a long ways. Um, and otherwise, uh, I think it, it. I was very pleased to see the plan. Um, there's going to be some issues with coming in over the existing culvert. The alignment needs to be adjusted a little bit, um, and that may pose an issue with some of the parking that's proposed for the public lot. But um, I'm sure that can all be figured out as we go along. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Kimberly Lambert and I live on Pines Edge Drive. Hi to all my neighbors on Zoom. I hope you're there at Pines Edge Drive. And uh, first I wanna thank the mayor so much for finding another resolution to the dog pound. That was absolutely fabulous. Thank you, mayor. Um, I'm hoping that the uh, planning board will come and meet with us at our in our neighborhood and explain to us what these measurements entail and how things will affect the brook that's on our property. Uh, it's not very clear the brook's not on the map. And I don't really see wetland buffers on the map at the edge of our property. Um, I hope somebody could come and talk to us about those things. Um, in terms of extending the water and sewer lines, you, Carolyn, you said that was an issue. Couldn't the city contribute um, some work on that from the $10 million cash that's left over from the ARPA funds? Um, also, I see that there's only one point one and a half parking spaces for each of the um, homes. And by the way, I think it's great that Habitat's gonna be doing this. Um, it'll be a lot easier to sell those if there's two parking spaces for each home. Um, a while ago, there was a traffic study that I completed and submitted to the city from the dates 2-2022 to 3-13-22, which also was done during some snowstorms, after snowstorms. During that time, I did, um, I think there was about 58 um, views um, during various times from 9.56 in the morning till 5.30 at night. 
This is in the winter. There are 344 cars total. The most cars that were um, cited were 15 cars, 2.52 p.m., 3.20 p.m., 2.25 p.m. 14 cars were there once, 13 cars were there once, 12 cars were there four times, and then you know several cars during various times of the day. So I don't advocate for 20 parking spaces there. And I see on the map that, um, I see on the map that they come up pretty close to that brook and I'm very concerned about that, protecting that brook. Um, the city could have been putting up some and Broadbrook Coalition could have put up some large maps at the entrance to show people where the other entrances to the Fitzgerald Lake conservation area are so that they wouldn't be tempted to um, park on Pines Edge and Cook Ave. Um, yes, no parking signs are due on Pines Edge Drive and Cook Ave because of the problem during the snow. Um, 20 spaces indicates to me that the city hasn't thought about and Broadbrook hasn't thought about what overuse consists of in a conservation area. That conservation area is for the flora and the fauna, the plants to protect the soil and the water there. When there's an asphalt parking lot there, that's going to impact the neighborhood and it's going to impact the ecosystem in that area because it gets really hot there in the summer. And I don't see anything about heat gradients and how that's going to affect uh, the people, the air, the water, or the plants and the animals in that area. I'm very much against 20 spaces. I think there's a lot of other solutions to that. And let's talk about those and look at those. Yes, we need parking, but we don't need 20 spaces. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alice Slozik and I live on Emily Lane and my property backs up to the, um, if you were to draw a line of the four um, habitat houses, my if you kept going straight in that line, that would hit my property. Um, so I'm concerned about what's happening, but I really appreciate the plan that you've come up with. I think it's a really good plan. I am very grateful that habitat is involved in it. And I also think that 20 spaces is um, a good number, not too many, because I spend a lot of time walking um, in the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. And there are a lot of times when there are lots and lots of cars there. Um, and I think the 20 spaces is, you know, if we can get that many spaces in there, that would be good um, to eliminate cars parking on Cook Avenue and in Pines Edge. Um, so I just wanted to make that short comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there aren't any more comments here, I think we'll go to Zoom. And the first um, hand raised I see is um, Tom Bassett. And just wanted to let you know, just a time check at 640. So um, we want to get through everyone's comments um, and also get you out on as promised. Okay, go ahead. Um, actually, sorry, let me just make sure. Okay, everyone can unmute themselves now when they're ready to speak. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hopefully the audio is coming through okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's a wonderful project. I was so glad to hear when the city came up with the solution for moving the dog pound, which was needed. And Pioneer Valley Habitat has a wonderful record and the city planning department working together with them to make both affordable housing and use of conservation land um, much easier. A uh, couple of things on the design. This is the first time I've had a chance to look at it, but I agree with the um, previous comment about lighting, uh, you know, nighttime lighting, or even just lighting affecting um, neighbors nearby. Uh, Try to use low impact. Uh, you know, the city has already adopted that. I think for for city streets. Um, so consider that. Uh, I'm, I wasn't sure what ac what ADA access is going to be part of this project uh, into the trails. Uh, you know, from the parking area or or how far that would would be a potential for 
either Broadbrook or somebody to um, you know make that ADA compatible uh, further into the conservation land like it is on North Farms Road. Um, I hope that we're not going to be putting gas lines, natural gas lines in there. Uh, I'm really uh, against any additional expansion of fossil fuel. Uh, fully support bike racks, that's great to have that option. And the comment about um, parking spaces, yeah, it looks like to me there's not enough parking space. You're really shortchanging the residents uh, of parking spaces. I would be more in favor of taking a couple parking spaces away from the conservation people and giving them to the residents. And why are you using a fence between the residents and the um, conservation parking? Why not natural barriers, uh, some bushes or fast growing yews, that sort of thing to, to be more in, in line with the neighborhood, which is a, a fairly uh, forested neighborhood. One last comment, uh, maybe we can get Broadbrook to put a picnic table in there somewhere just before the entrance to the conservation area. Uh, it's a wonderful project. I look forward to it moving ahead and I'd like to hear uh, soon uh, what the timetable is. Thank you for letting me comment. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Betty Petrasek. Hi, thank you. I live on Hatfield Street at the corner of uh, Cook and Hatfield Street. And um, I think the plan is excellent. I love the development. I think everything looks good. Um, I do think that the parking for the conservation area is important because that does get a lot of use. My main concern though is traffic, um, foot traffic and car vehicle traffic coming out of Cook Avenue. Um, I realize it's only for families, but is it, are there going to be children there? And has anyone considered putting sidewalks in on Cook Avenue if you're going to develop families in that area? And also there's the um, Bridge Road development and people are going to cross Bridge Road and come down Hatfield Street and there's no sidewalks and it's not safe to walk on Hatfield Street. That's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pat O'Reilly. Sorry, trying to unmute myself. Pat O'Reilly, I live at 103 Pines Edge. I've lived there for uh, 30 years. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their work on this project. Um, I think it's great that Habitat for Humanity is um, overseeing it. I am very grateful for the number of parking spaces that you have decided to try to keep at this site. Um, my biggest concern is um, the emer availability ability of the emergency access vehicles being able to get into Pines Edge Drive when the parking lot has been closed, as other people have mentioned. It is literally impossible for even a car to pull out of Pines Edge Drive out onto Cook Avenue. It's one in one direction, let alone getting a, an ambulance or a fire truck up there. Um, Again, also low, the low impact or minimal lighting because we agreed decades ago that we would not be impacting the animals that are around us by adding to the, the light at night. So that's why we don't have any parking lights in our condo association lots. When the lot at um, the old Moose Lodge has been closed, I live all the way up in the back of the condo association. And we have had people drive up and park in our lot, which is a private lot, and head out into the woods trying to find the trails. So whatever the city can do that can maintain the maximum number of parking spaces for people using the conservation area as well as, well as accommodating the people who will be living there would be greatly appreciated. And Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up is Jeff Friedman. 
Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Jeff Friedman, I live, uh, my wife and I live um, uh, at uh, 164, uh, where the last house on the left uh, before uh, the Moose Lodge property. Um, so appreciate everybody's work on this. Uh, really happy that Habitat is going to be involved um, and all the thought that's going into this and the thoughtfulness. Um, uh, just a couple questions. One, I, um, I too would think it would be incredibly valuable to walk the property, as my wife Michelle mentioned. Uh, you know, and uh, you have, if you put up a few stakes here and there and some flags so we can kind of see where these units are going to go. Um, I too have the question that Terry Reynolds brought up, uh, which is if that northeasternmost unit were to be were, were to be brought down uh, further to the southwest, uh, then it's I sort of feel like a lot of cars driving in and out of this parking lot. Um, if they drive in while it's still dark, uh, people going in early in the morning and whatnot, there are going to be a lot of car lights shining right into the the, the front front of that house the way I'm, I'm looking at it. So um, whether whether that can be done in terms of the ledge and the wetlands, I'm not sure, but I, I think I'd be interested to hear more about that. Um, one question I do have is, uh, you know, and maybe it's in the design there, said something on the plan for a proposed shed or something. I wonder if uh, these four folk, uh, sorry, four houses will have any kind of sort of storage, outdoor storage, um, and, and maybe that was talked about before. Um, but I too think uh, if, if they could have two parking spaces per unit, uh, that could be a lot more desirable. Um, let me just see, anything? And and I too are interested in 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 the town doing their due diligence with the project and minimizing the the uh, ex, you know the the lighting impact. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Tina White. I think is the last person who I see has their hand raised. Hello, um, my name is Tina White, and I am also on the board of the Broadbrook Coalition. Um, and was here to advocate for um, the 20 parking spaces to minimize um, the impact on the local neighbors. And um, also wanted to um, make a plug for um, reduced lighting. Um, and part of reduced lighting is, as um, some have previously mentioned, making sure that it's turned off when not used. So um, kind of making sure that the people who are moving in there realize that they're moving into a dark area. Um, sometimes people come from more urban areas and are not used to being it that dark, but um, it's really lovely to have it that dark and important for wildlife as well. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you very much for having um, this forum so that the public could speak on it. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, okay. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so um, let me just double check here. Okay. I think we're good. Um, well, th that's a lot of good feedback and thanks for your comments. I think just a little bit on process. Um, certainly after this meeting, anyone can contact our office. Um, my email address was on the original notice. And so feel free to email me, um, cmish at northamptonma.gov. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, the process moving forward is, um, will be sort of, um, potentially some design changes. We'll work with Habitat to see what they want to do in terms of prepping for a hearing for permitting um, so that the permits can go through the process. Construction timelines are going to be um, different between the two projects. The city will would be doing the parking lot at a different pace from Habitat. Um, and so um, we certainly are also um, aware and appreciate the comments about the construction hours. 
And I just want to let anybody know if there are, no matter who's, if it's your neighbor, if it's another neighbor, anybody who has contractors around starting construction before seven on a regular basis, or, you know, even if it happens to be on the weekend, um, you should call the building department or the police department because those are the rules in the city. So even if, you know, we contract and we tell folks that they can't start before X hours or, or and they have to finish, um, sometimes um, that slips. So there's no problem with contacting the city about that when that happens. Um, we will certainly... <clears throat> Um, the lighting issues will come up during um, planning board, but obviously Habitat's heard that we're not planning on lighting in the parking lot at all. So um, that um, wouldn't be part of that process um, for the for the parking lot side. Um, and typically of a permit of this size, you don't have parking lot lights, you just have built, you know, house lights over the entryways. So, um, but that gets looked at in, at the planning board um, review process. Um, so uh, and, uh, just also note that <clears throat> when we do the, when the applications are submitted or the plans are finalized, uh, public hearing notices are sent out to the abutters um, and notice is also posted in the Gazette and we put a yellow sign up similar to what you saw at the um, site over the last couple of weeks. So there will be, um, you will notify and I of course keep in touch with the with um, Councilor Moulton to let um, him know of any um, subsequent steps that will be taken. So. And I know that we also support many of the comments that were made tonight. Uh, you know, I think eight parking spaces for the houses make sense too. So you don't get into which ones are for which house and all those things. Um, and we typically build slab on grade with a shed to provide storage for trash or bicycles or things like that, um, either detached or attached. Sometimes that's a nice architectural way to create a covered entry between a shed and a house. We don't have architectural plans for this project. This is still at that concept phase, but we have a number of other plans we've done throughout the city, and I'm happy to share those with anyone who reaches out to me. Um, but the focus on, you know, I heard the comment about minimalizing lighting, about what the buffer is between the two spaces, between the public and private space. Um, that it's important to not have too much overflow into the neighborhood. And I th my understanding is the parking lot will get built first. So if that's closed for a certain amount of time, hopefully we can keep the public parking open while we're doing construction um, on the side. I would imagine we, there wouldn't be any reason to close that. But yeah. I mean, yeah, we'd have to work on that in terms of constructing the parking lot. I think similar to the situation that um, um, that was handled for the demolition of the Moose Lodge building, the site would have to be closed because there's just too much. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just not safe for anyone to be walking in and around. So um, we would, again, notify um, ward councilor, um, um, Broadbrook coalition to get the word out and just, um, generally all the city councilors, just so everyone around the city understands that that access would be closed off for the duration of sort of the, the, the bulk of the construction because, and, and probably it would be fenced off anyway. So. <clears throat> Carol, Carolyn, what's yeah. your best estimate of when the first permitting would go to the planning board sometime later this spring summer yeah probably spring early summer i would think okay yeah and uh, conservation commission also gets yes involved? yes conservation okay. right hearings before the conservation commission so there, there are two bodies that uh, will be holding public hearings um i will certainly i think i know most of the people who spoke tonight you know how to reach me uh, most of you get my newsletter so i will be uh certainly uh, letting you know about those public hearings as they arise. And thanks, thanks for your thoughtful comments. It was, it was great. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Um, is there any plan or could you add a plan for some kind of landscaping buffer to protect the brook from the heat 
that will be coming from the um, from the parking lot. And um, also, um, many of the neighbors here have been impacted by the intersection at Cook and Hatfield Street. And it's very concerning that we're going to add more um, more people coming in and out of that intersection. We just had a couple of accidents there within two weeks of each other. Um, can't the city start some traffic? calming mechanisms there now instead of waiting for the state and their decisions around the uh, rotary down at the end of uh, Hatfield at North King. We need something done at that intersection now at the Cook-Hatfield intersection. It's very dangerous for pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers. Very quickly, um, Michelle Bernhard, there are more young families, more kids in this neighborhood than there have been the 25 years that I've been there. And um, a lot of those kids go to Jackson Street and it's walkable and um, it would be really important um, to have that safety for the neighborhood. Thanks. Go ahead, Bob. Kimberly brought up, I think, a very important issue, and it's that intersection of Cook Avenue and Hatfield Street. And I wonder whether that could be made a four-way stop. That would alleviate the situation um, a great deal, because I find that a very difficult intersection as well. And I can imagine people uh, living um, at Pine's Edge and going to the shopping center and so forth must, um, must find that a big pain. So a four-way stop would really alleviate it. Um, yeah, I'm not going to venture into what the solution is because the engineers have to look at that based on all the data, but that is part of DOT's charge. And I know that um, our DPW has certainly heard all the comments about this. And that's, I mean, I think it was impressed upon um, Mass DOT at that public meeting about re- opening the roundabout um, construction project, that this um, this intersection was part of that originally and that it's important piece of the project going forward. And I know that um, DOT is working on those designs. And Carolyn, if I could just add, uh, separate from the the big DOT project, uh, there there is, I, I know of at least one formal traffic calming request that Betty Petrosic, who spoke on Zoom, has filed with, with the DPW about the Hatfield Street Cook Avenue intersection. And that is making its way through the analysis that the DPW and the police department does. So my expectation is that we're not waiting for the DOT to finally resolve this bigger picture involving the roundabout. Uh, there will be some action, uh, I hope, on the uh, on the part of the city before the DOT project. And uh, I, I'm sensitive, and I'm sure uh, others uh, in, in municipal uh, government are very sensitive to the fact that uh, this has been an issue for 20 years or longer. All right, 30 years uh, for those of you who live in that neighborhood. So uh, we're working on it. construction okay when you close the lot for parking lot construction can there be a sign that says trailhead is closed no parking no access and then maybe a list of the other entrances where they can go because what people have been doing is they'll park up pine's edge and then they'll sneak around the fence to get to the trail or they go up to the end of our condo complex and bushwhack. Mm -hmm. They try to find trails. So the no parking signs up Pines Edge and Cook Avenue are really, I hope, happen prior to this construction. Mm -hmm. Also, on a sidebar, many people come to that parking lot and their dogs are not on a leash. Mm -hmm. They get out of the car and the dogs run like crazy. And I hope the four units moving in are aware of the fact that there are going to be dogs and um, you, we just can't seem to control the leash thing because there's nobody monitoring the area. It's enforcement. There's no enforcement. You know, people just, the, it's it's a free for all. So um, so anyway, but I think signage and no parking signs up, up Pine's Edge and uh, somehow there's got to be a, a deterrent to 
to get the traffic to go to other entrances during construction. Yeah. Because if not, we're going to be battling as a community with just people parking wherever they want and bushwhacking, which is what they'll do. So thank you very much. I want to say you guys have all had very constructive comments, and I really appreciate coming to a public meeting where everyone's like, housing for people who can't afford it. That sounds like a really meaningful thing to do. And um, so applaud Northampton. So thank you.